Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. I, I decided, by the way, against the singing for my supper today, uh, so you might uh, have to wait for next occasion uh, to hear me sing, but perhaps I'll get another invitation, uh, uh, perhaps after my intervention or not. We'll, uh, we'll see about that. Um, it's quite some time ago that my wife and I were sent to Accra in West Africa, the capital of Ghana, long ago as a young diplomat. And after two weeks, the ambassador said to me, sir, or Yap rather, you should go to a village halfway up North Ghana uh, because there is a Dutch non-governmental organization which has uh, given a dental unit. We don't like dentist chairs, but they had given a dental unit uh, to the village. And you're going to present it on behalf of that non-governmental organization. So up my wife and I drove to the village and we had a very nice uh, afternoon, lots of pomp and circumstance, uh, lots of nice drinks. Ghanaians are very, very kind people indeed. The end of the afternoon, when the ceremony was almost over, I saw from the corner of my eye one of the chief's assistants, the chief of the village's assistants, standing next to him with a goat on a rope. And I said to my wife, I hope this goat is not going to be our present because we had driven up to the village in our passenger car and how the heck are you going to transport to go back to the capital in the back seat of the passenger car. I was wrong because it was our present. And without further ado, we uploaded, as it's called by now, we didn't know then what uploading was, but now we'll do. We uploaded the goat into the car and after 15 minutes drive, the goat started doing things a goat shouldn't do in a car and I said to my wife, we should get rid of the goat. And my wife said, and how right she was and how wrong I was, you can't do that. Because it's refusing a gift. And I said, well, out with the goat. And my opinion prevailed. So uh, we set the goat free and drove on happily, chatting back to Accra, the capital of Ghana. Two days later, the embassy's doorbell rang. And there was a young man asking for Mr. Hauptschreffer. So the guard came to me and said, there's a visitor for you, sir. I was a young third secretary of embassy. And you can, uh, you might imagine uh, what happened. There was a young man with a goat on a rope. And he told me the words I'll never forget. You forgot your present, sir. I'm here on behalf of the chief to hand you your present. It's a funny story, but I've never forgotten it. Because what had I failed to do before going to Ghana, before embarking on a new experience and living on a continent I did not know at all. I had forgotten, and that's a basic mistake I have never made again, I hope, to familiarize myself with the culture, the history, the traditions of that nation, Ghana. And that's a dire lesson, it was a dire lesson for me, and I think it's an important lesson for you as the next generation that as soon as you enter into international diplomacy, as soon as you cross a border, and as soon as you speak to people representing other nations, and you'll do that all this week, please do not forget to know what makes those people tick. You do that in a world which is more complicated than the world I grew up in. That world was not without danger, it was the era of the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States of America, both having huge arsenals of nuclear weapons. But the world was more predictable than it is as we speak, and as you are going to meet. Did anyone talk about piracy? Piracy on the high seas, even five years ago? Did anyone raise cyber warfare five years ago? Had anyone heard about a memory stick, a USB stick, smuggled into an uranium enrichment plant in Iran and trying to ruin the enrichment, uranium enrichment program they have there? Did anyone mention the security implications of climate change five years ago? The melting of the ice cap on the North Pole, giving much more accessibility to all kinds of raw materials, raising questions of sovereignty, opening new sea lanes, I think you did not do that, and I didn't do that either. Did we raise energy security to put a nation under pressure by cutting off its energy supplies? All kinds of subjects, not being extensively discussed only five, six, seven years ago, 
and now on the front pages of our newspapers every day. Could you have imagined, or could I have imagined, that NATO still has 140,000 troops in a faraway nation like Afghanistan, where the Taliban regime was toppled almost exactly 10 years ago? Did we hear about impro improvised explosive devices, roadside bombs remotely controlled by a mobile telephone, and killing many Afghan innocent civilians, and also killing, killing many of our soldiers? The world has changed, and it has fundamentally changed, and it is fundamentally changing for a second reason. By the way, had any one of you dared to predict the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening? when this Tunisian vegetable vendor set himself ablaze. Mistrust, dear friends, mistrust anyone who tells you that they had predicted the Arab Awakening. And do not trust anyone who says that he or she knows exactly how the world will evolve and how the world will further develop. But I see another major development, and that is that the center of gravity, or centers of gravity, I should say, are shifting. It is not anymore only the United States of America or the old continent Europe calling the shots. Have you heard about the BRICS a few years ago? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa? That terminology, that term was coined only a year and a half, two years ago. So lots of things are happening in the world. But speaking as a European, I do know that Europe doesn't call the shots anymore. The Americans know, President Obama qualifying himself as the first Pacific president, the Americans know that their interests and their headaches or their migraines are not in the transatlantic relationships, but are elsewhere. How to cope with China? How to cope with India? How to cope with this? shifting center of gravity. I don't doubt, dear friends, I do not doubt that for the foreseeable future, the United States of America will be by far the most important, the strongest military power. And economically, perhaps as well. But that, the perhaps is already creeping in, because I simply don't know. If you take into account that China has already overtaken Japan as the third economy in, in the world. Now, what does this mean? Why am I raising this? I'm raising this for two reasons. The world's center of gravity shifting and these new threats and challenges I mentioned. We continue to need, perhaps even more than before, rules-based international organizations. Because if we do not have rules-based international organizations, what we'll see is ad hoc diplomacy. And we'll see the rights of the strongest who will prevail. And that is not in the interest of many nations in this world, including mine in the Netherlands, where you are now, by the way. So we need rules-based international organization. Let me just, just mention a few relevant for the coming week for you. What about the United Nations? What about the Security Council? Is the composition of the Security Council up to date? Of course it is not. It's still, to a large extent, apart from China's access to the Security Council already quite some years ago, it still reflects the situation in the world as it was in 1945, three years before even I was born, and this is Granddaddy talking. <laughs> the background of this is very serious. If the reform process of the United Nations, and more specifically the Security Council, is the most important body in the United Nations, deciding about legality, illegality, legitimacy, illegitimacy. If that reform process stays the way it is, and that is completely stalled in an impasse, I'm afraid the Security Council is going to lose credibility. And that is the reason that I, and I hope that you, in your simulations, will take this into account. Because if those new kids on the block, and I can mention Indonesia, I can mention Brazil, South Africa, I mentioned already. If they don't have a voice, if they have the impression that other nations are deciding for them, they will revert to ad hoc diplomacy. And they'll move away from the rules-based organizations. And why is this rules-based so important? So important? 
It is because rules-based goes together with the notions governance and accountability. Accountability is a very important keyword in international relations, in my, in my opinion, and so is governance, global governance. Not a global government, but global governance. So there's a lot of work to do in the United Nations as the standard bearer, the most important multilateral international organization. I go a bit closer. The European Union, yes, it's rules-based. No questions about its uh, legitimacy. But also in dire straits, I dare to say. I mentioned already the notion that the old continent doesn't call the shots anymore. Remember my goat story, we Europeans have long thought and still think that our background in the Jewish Christian humanist tradition and culture and religions is the dominant factor in this world. It is not anymore. The world is globalizing. And I can tell you that as NATO Secretary General, and NATO is par excellence, to say two words in French, rooted in that Jewish Christian humanist culture and tradition, that when I had to operate in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, I remember the goat story, and I didn't go there, and I went there 17, 18 times, before I had familiarized myself much better, and prepared myself much better on the culture, the religion, the traditions of that nation than I did when I went to Ghana in the 70s of the last century. So there's a mental challenge in Europe. We do not call the shots anymore. The same goes, as, as I said, for the United States of America, despite its military might. But politically, Europe is rather weak. It's still rather strong economically, despite the huge euro and financial crisis. Think about Greece, think about Portugal, Ireland, Italy. But how do you cope with giants like India and China if you can't do that on the basis of one single European voice? May I welcome the Dutch Foreign Minister, Minister Edwin Rosenthal, who I can see entering, entering the room. And given the fact that I'm here, I think it would be, it is very appropriate that I uh, say a warm welcome to the Foreign Minister. Europe. Yes. So coping with giants like China and India means the precondition of one single European voice. And in the political domain, unfortunately, that single European voice is not there. And there's a lot of work to do. And in Europe, we use a Dutch expression to the other side of the dikes. We're fine behind our dikes here. The problem of sitting behind a dike, in my opinion, is that you keep the water out fine. But nobody will see you. And you want to be seen, if, like a nation like the Netherlands, you're so dependent on international trade. So, there's also a lot of homework to do for uh, the, Euro the European Union. The same, ladies and gentlemen, goes for NATO, the organization I had the privilege to lead for five and a half years. NATO has a new strategic concept. NATO is rules-based. NATO has full legitimacy. NATO is extremely active in Afghanistan, now in Libya, although I would like to see, and the foreign minister without any doubt, would like to see more NATO allies participating in, in, in Libya. NATO is still in Kosovo. NATO has uh, a number of ships in an anti-piracy mission in the Gulf of Aden and off the coast of Somalia. So NATO is very active. But remember, Obama qualifying himself as the first Pacific president. Obama's headaches are elsewhere and not in the transatlantic relationship. And that means that in the NATO alliance, we have to be careful in the words of the former Secretary of Defense of the United States, Robert Gates, that in NATO we do not see the development of a two-tier alliance where the Europeans are lagging behind in defense spending and in taking their responsibility. So here again, NATO also has a lot of work to do on the basis of my mantra, rules-based governance and accountability. I could mention, but I don't have the time, a lot of other international organizations which are important for you to be informed about their existence. 
I could mention the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You might not have heard about the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Why, why is that SCO important? And in my opinion, growing in importance, because the Russians and the Chinese are members. The SCO is dealing with an important region in the world, often neglected by us Europeans, which is Central Asia. Iran is an observer. Uh, it is an organization, in my opinion, to watch. And the same, of course, goes for uh, the African Union, an important player in the Libya uh, uh, operation uh, as, as we speak. For the League of Arab Nations, of course, uh, the same is uh, relevant, and I would add the organization of the Islamic Conference. Not all organizations, I hasten to add, who are as effective or as efficient or, for that matter, as democratic as we would like them to be, but they are international organizations uh, to, keep, uh, to keep in mind. Having said all this, and I'm coming to a close, we should realize, and it was in, quite rightly in the invitation letter, the organizers uh, of the time in Sunday, we should realize that in this young 21st century, in this complex world, new challenges, new threats, international organizations under threat, it is not only governments, who call the shots. Non-governmental organizations, multinational companies, may I mention in the European perspective the huge political role played by credit rating agencies. They might think they call the shots, I hope they don't. Credit rating agencies. Do not forget, please, but for you that's more normal than for me, the, the new social media. The pluses, as we saw on Tahrir Square in Egypt, as we can see in Syria as we speak, because Assad can say many things, but he can't say that he's not shooting his own people, thanks to the mini-cameras in, in the mobile phone. New media have their negative side as well, because we are not anymore part of one and the same news cycle, one and the same news world, because you can be very selective on the internet. So social media, they have their pluses in the sense of good governance and democracy, they also, I think, have their minuses, and you might be confronted with new and uh, social media. Other actors are relevant, and I think your generation will further grow up with an even growing importance of those actors. And when I mention those new actors, I stress again the notion which should be written, the word which should be written with a capital A, and that is accountability. You can only convince public opinion in the foreign policy and foreign affairs domain that you come to certain decisions when you have public opinion and parliamentary opinion on your side. And that can be awfully difficult, as Foreign Minister Rosenthal knows better than anyone in this room. It can be very difficult to convince public opinion in the Netherlands or elsewhere, but to convince public opinion in the Netherlands that it is useful to have a police training mission in Kunduz in the northern part of Afghanistan. Because remember what I said about globalization. The majority of public opinions, what, 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 what the heck should we do in Kunduz? Why are we putting our people into harm's way to go to Afghanistan? Let's focus on our own nation. Let's stay behind the dikes. That is impossible. And the fact that you are here, I hope, is that you with me consider that an impossible scenario. But write the words accountability with a capital A. Write the word please, rules-based, with a capital R and with a capital B. And do not forget that we need rules-based international organizations. It was a pleasure to receive your invitations and I wish you all a very fruitful and interesting coming week in the framework uh, of Tamil. Thank you very much for your attention.